Hi, everybody. I'm Shanali Basak. I'm the Wall Street correspondent for Bloomberg Television and for Bloomberg News. I'm so pleased now to be joined by Maya Korengel, who's the co-managing partner of the RISE Fund, which has about $5 billion in assets. It was founded in 2016 by TPG and in partnership with Bono and Jeff Skoll. Then I also have with me Kelly Schmidt, the CEO of Benevity, which provides software that's focused on social responsibility and employee engagements to a wide range of corporations. And Kelly, as we talk about the S, the social part of ESG, maybe it's worth starting with you to talk about what your software really helps your clients do. Sure. So Benevity's mission uh, as a company, or as we call it, our moonshot is really to act as a catalyst to infuse a culture of goodness into the world. So what does that mean? We are helping companies help their people to be their best selves by connecting them with a sense of purpose to deliver not just social impact, but business impact as well. And so Benevity provides a SaaS platform. It's used by almost 700 purpose-driven companies today really to engage all of their stakeholders around their ESG initiatives, whether that's giving back to communities through granting, whether it's employee match donations, volunteering, their diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives that they're managing through employee resource groups, or even just engaging you know, people in pro-social actions and environmentally sustainable um, actions. And so we really are helping them to activate and capture and measure and report on all of that impact. Maya, maybe it's worth taking a step back also and talking about the RISE Fund, how you've grown to be this $5 billion entity. You know, you, you were pretty early in ESG, given that you guys were founded in 2016. How did this partnership come together, and how are you now expanding it with Benevity? Great. Thanks, Sonali. So the RISE Fund invests in companies across a series of sectors that are very intentionally focused on uh, increasing social and environmental impact, positive social and environmental impact, in addition to building sort of great companies, just the kind of companies that we would normally invest in at TPG. And um, in the category of what we call technology for good, um, the RISE Fund was very interesting, interested in partnering with companies and providing growth capital to companies that are very explicitly helping other enterprise to increase the good that they can do in the world. And Benevity is a fabulous example of this. One of the things that we do um, at RISE is look for um, large market opportunities. We look for terrific uh, management teams. Uh, Kelly is a prime example of the kind of CEO who we want to back. Um, and her team is an exceptional team who have uh, great technical skill, but also who are very, very driven by purpose. But importantly, what Benevity does, which RISE um, really, really uh, resonated with, is allow companies to amplify and scale impact on the ground because of the services that Benevity provides. So this was one of the key um, uh, investment hypothesis, if you will, uh, for RISE when we partnered with Benevity that it enables um, scores of um, employees, um, scores of companies, and amplifies impact all over the world because it enables corporate uh, uh, donation matching um, of employee donations, because it enables volunteering, because it serves as a filter that helps uh, companies and employees identify um, uh, viable and um, impactful nonprofits and causes to help back. So the combination of all of these uh, activities really allows us to scale and amplify impact around the world, while at the same time, obviously, backing a terrific company that is at the forefront of a lot of um, ES of the ESG movement, you know, that that's not only present in North America, but in Europe, mm -hmm. in Asia, and all across the world today. Well, one interesting thing that you had just mentioned, Maya, was that uh, a lot of this allows for corporate giving and, and, uh, and grants and donations. But there's this other part of this, Kelly, that you also brought up about internal DNI practices. You know, where, how are your clients, Kelly, balancing 
both the philanthropic and the, the giving aspect of uh, being involved in a community versus the business aspect and doing better business? Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely evolved a, a lot in uh, in the last couple of years in terms of the role that companies are playing there. And so, you know, workplaces today um, are playing a very critical role in society in helping their people grapple with difficult issues that are really the crux of the S in ESG. You know, one example of this is we did a survey recently where it, it said that 77% of employees think it's important for companies to allow difficult conversations around race and social issues to occur at work. And nearly 40% said they would likely quit their jobs and go elsewhere if their company didn't prioritize those issues. And I can say that certainly wasn't the case when I joined the workforce 20 years ago. And so, you know, as companies um, are investing more heavily in these things, they're, they're balancing, you know, traditional corporate social responsibility, which used to be more about giving back to the communities they operate in with all of these social issues that their people uh, and their customers frankly care about. You know, Maya, it's interesting. You're a strategic minority investor in Benevity, and I'm wondering if there's some way that you're working with Benevity to expand what you do across other clients or uh, other members of your sphere of influence, really. Yeah, that's a great uh, question. And, and, you know, within the RISE Fund, in certain situations, we are a control investor. In other situations, we are a minority investor. And in the case of Benevity, we have a very good and strong uh, partnership with the other investors in the company. But one thing that the RISE Fund in particular uh, can do because of our focus on positive impact is to um, work with Kelly um, and her team, uh, Sona Kozla, for example, the head of impact, to bring to bear all of our knowledge and understanding of what matters to companies um, in terms of um, corporate responsibility, ESG. Um, we can bring to bear our understanding of how to measure and report on positive impact. And we can bring to bear uh, our academic resources. So one of the things that the RISE Fund does is to really rely on um, academic research and third party evidence to validate that good is being done in the world by virtue of our companies. And so we have a, a whole series of reporting um, that shows how employee engagement increases, how um, corporate uh, donation matching increases increases uh, donations overall to nonprofits, how uh, the systems that we have within Benevity, again, enable us to find um, the right kind of nonprofits or causes to partner with. So ensuring that we minimize fraud or, or you know, other sort of negative consequences. And we can bring our, our full toolkit to the table to work with Benevity's team to help explain this to corporate partners. The other thing that we and um, the other investors at the table um, at, at, at uh, Benevity do is to make introductions. So at TPG, we were a user of Benevity's platform uh, for many years before we invested in the company, which is proof in and of itself of, of the power and the value of Benevity. So as a customer, um, not, not only as an investor, but also as a customer, we can talk to our other portfolio companies within TPG or our other relationships about the good that Benevity does, the impact that it amplifies in the world, but also the employee engagement um, and the positive benefits to culture within companies, to increasing employee loyalty, employee satisfaction, because they feel that their companies care about causes that matter to them. So these are all uh, things that we can bring to the table in our work with Benevity. Yeah, this is really interesting too. And I'm wondering if Kelly, you could provide some tangible data or use cases of uh, some of the things that you're doing with your clients, because we are hearing this issue come up a lot about employee satisfaction. And we are in this era where stakeholder capitalism has been a conversation for a number of years, but it's not an idea that's uh, that we can say has garnered complete consensus, right? There are still areas, corporations, uh, certain CEOs that need convincing that this is better for their business. So what can you give them to hold on to that shows them that this is a better way of doing business? 
Yeah, there's actually uh, a lot more data today than there was when we were, you know, embarking on this uh, 10 years ago around the business value of investing in ESG. And essentially it shows that the companies that invest in, in these programs and these initiatives, they do better on, on everything from revenue to earnings per share. And, and an area that we focus on is also employee retention. And so, you know, we have companies um, in our ecosystem, you know, such as, you know, Google and Apple and Microsoft on the tech side, we've got Citigroup, World Bank on the financial services side, Nike, Nordstrom on the retail side. And we're seeing, you know, goodness and purpose. It's, it's important uh, in every industry and every type of company. And what we found looking at the data for, the, for our own clients is that those who engage in volunteering and giving through their companies, they're 57% they're less likely to churn and go off and find another job elsewhere. And so we don't often think about social impact as a, as a critical lever for retention, but in a hot job market like we're in today, it actually uh, is important. And many of our clients report correlation, you know, not just with retention, but with things like higher employee engagement scores, pride, promotion of more diverse talent within their organizations, and even customer affinity and loyalty as well. That's a fascinating statistic. And also, you know, another big giant step back here, because I don't want to take for granted that the S part of ESG uh, is so well known and understood that everybody knows how to do it. When I was, as long as I've been covering ESG, the E part of it is really what seems to have been the part that people got a handle on. But the S part is also very broad as well. Maya, how do you start to define the opportunities in the social part of ESG uh, for LPs, uh, for companies, for anybody that's looking to make this a more even part of the pie? Yeah, that's a great question, Sonali, because, you know, with all of the conversation about um, climate change and the challenges wrought by uh, climate change, um, we want to make sure that the S is not um, diminished or forgotten. And I think, you know, for better, for worse, over the course of the last year, um, the S has become um, uh, even more pronounced in terms of its importance and the urgency of dealing with the S with the racial justice uh, movement, with refugee crises around the world, um, and frankly, the uh, effects of climate change on uh, poor and uh, low-income individuals is much greater, so there's an S component there. Within the RISE Fund, we translate the S into investment categories for ourselves. Um, so we look at S in terms of financial inclusion, access to better health care, access to better education, um, these are investment categories that make sense to us, but which also have very positive impacts on uh, systemic challenges that lead to inequity. So um, if we think about um, investments that we've made in the education space, whether it's Instride um, that works with companies like Starbucks and others to allow um, uh, uh, working adults who haven't finished their college degree to gain their college degree and um, basically ladder up uh, in, 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 their, in their workplace and have access to better jobs because they get their college degree, or whether we think about financial inclusion companies like Acorns or Varro Bank, which um, help uh, everyday Americans to save more, invest more, to get access to fee-free free checking and other financial services. Um, these are among the companies that are important to us on the S side, but one of the killer apps on the S side are companies like Benevity that are for us impact as a service company. So again, they are companies that can work with other enterprises, generally through a technology platform that enable those companies to um, speak to uh, achieving better values and and a, and a better and a better society, but you know taking action as a corporate themselves. So there are various themes that we invest in in, in the Rise Fund. You know some iconic companies in different categories, all with the effort to um, basically make a dent in systemic inequity to allow better access to um, healthcare, education, job opportunities, and, and a better life for all, while at the same time on our east side addressing you know, the health of the planet. 
It's such an interesting uh, point to make the ability of technology to level the playing field because it's coming out of a crisis where there was a lot of worries about just the opposite, right? The big tech firms getting much bigger, uh, tech displacing jobs, and the ability of our workforce to really meet this new uh, technology environment. And Kelly, you know, maybe you could provide some examples of where technology could be used to create the most good. Yeah, I mean, we certainly uh, saw quite a rapid shift in the last year in terms of how nonprofits and, and causes around the world had to shift their operations from, you know, you know, the, a world that was mostly physical to being entirely digital. And so that's just one, um, you know, very current example of how Benevity and other similar tech has helped to make that shift. You know, some of the things that um, Benevity was setting out to change, you know, back when the company was founded was just the inefficiencies in the charitable side of the ecosystem. So, you know, back then, 5% of donations were be being done online. It's still only 15%. Tech is helping that, but still has the ability to change it. And, uh, and you know, how little of those donations were coming from corporations, and we're now helping to facilitate that and also helping um, businesses to be able to measure the impact uh, of those investments as well. It's amazing, too, because you saw this during the pandemic, just a great uh, need and demand for people to be giving back to their own communities at a time where, you know, for the most people who stepped outside, you know, here in New York, the food lines, right, for the food pantries were just completely down the street and, you know, endless for months. And, and it was a real need to give back to your own community, the, the power of the, the employee. I'm wondering what kind of engagement figures you had, Kelly, uh, that may have risen or changed at all uh, during and after the pandemic. Yeah, probably the biggest one is that last year we actually saw, well, you know, a lot of the headlines said that, you know, many nonprofits, depending what their areas of focus were, struggled and overall donations were down last year. Through our platform, donations were actually up 74%. And so once again, technology um, enabling. And so we actually, you know, there definitely was a trend before COVID, before Black Lives Matter of companies, um, you know, working to solve some of these systemic issues. Um, but when these things hit, you know, last year, um, they were really um, under pressure from their people, from their customers to do more. And people wanted to give back um, you know, in more immediate and sustainable ways uh, than ever before. And we definitely saw that reflected uh, in our own business and, and just the amount of giving and even volunteering that was done through the platform. Maya, I'm curious about this next wave. When you look at the next 12 months, when it comes to social investing, where do you see investors putting the most of their dollars? Yeah, so I think I think that the uh, digital or the technology business models are going to be um, extremely important. So as for all of the reasons that Kelly mentioned, but also because technology allows you to um, process multiple transactions, even small uh, transactions at very low cost. Technology allows you tr to transcend uh, borders and um, and to transcend. Um, the limitations of physical environment, as we saw with our education portfolio and our financial services portfolio during the time of COVID, the, those that were digitally enabled, um, ed tech companies, fintech companies really did extremely well as um, the world moved online. And, and the new normal is going to have a lot more, um, uh, you know, sort of digital engagement as, as things goes forward. But I think one of the um, look forwards is that the past year has really underscored the importance of corporate social responsibility. And it has underscored it not just from a top-down perspective, but from a bottoms-up perspective. A lot of individuals, because of the crises that we've lived through, because of the challenges of the work-from-home environment, have really been thinking about what it means to work for a company, what kind of community um, they belong to you know, at work. And work um, is no longer just a paycheck. It's a, it's a source of community. It's an expression of people's values. And this is why um, I think Benevity is so important um, as a solution for different companies. And this is why for us, the impact as a service space or the technology for good space is so critical because the nature of what companies need to do in the future in terms of not just 
um, satisfying, you know, consumer demand with whatever product and service that they have, but also more holistically um, making statements to employees, customers, suppliers, regulators um, about sort of the good that they stand for and living that through um, with the help of uh, uh, service providers like Benevity is going to become more and more critical. So we see a lot of tailwinds for the technology as a good market. And Kelly, you have now this new investment as well. And uh, I'm wondering for you, what does the next year hold for you in ways that you can adapt, change, grow, uh, and kind of focusing on the areas that your clients are, are asking for more of? Yeah, at Benevity, we're actually calling 2021 the year of S. And, you know, as we, we said earlier, the focus has historically been primarily on the E. It's now really the S. And so it probably needs to be the decade or maybe even the generation of S because some of these social issues like DEI and B don't change overnight and don't change on a quarterly cadence. And so, you know, we're really seeing that commitment to the long-term benefit for companies to realize um, the value of their investments uh, in this area. And so for us, you know, um, we're leaning in more to the S, the reporting side. You know, we've hired uh, a chief data officer this year. We're doing a lot more around the impact reporting and measuring, helping companies to measure uh, the value of these investments because they do have real business value. And that's definitely a big uh, focus for us this year. We're also expanding uh, our offering to, you know, be able to facilitate more of the employee resource groups and bring those, uh, you know, that community aspect to some of the discussions that are happening uh, on these difficult issues. I think, you know, we were maybe a little bit surprised at Benevity when um, the Black Lives Matter movement started and many of our clients started reaching out saying, what do we do? And, you know, internally, we were still figuring out um, what we would do within the Benevity uh, community as well. And so it's certainly a quickly uh, evolving area. And so we're, we're changing, you know, we're putting a lot more focus on that this coming year. Maya, maybe you do have a few parting words of advice for folks who are not as familiar on how to socially invest that uh, they can use to start getting into it in a bigger way. Yeah. No, so so the, the surprising thing is that across every category, whether you're a retail investor, whether you're um, a family office or high net worth individual, or whether you're you know, a pension fund, uh, a sovereign wealth fund, or, or some other kind of institutional investor, the opportunities to um, align values on the E side and the S side with your investing without compromising financial returns, so while uh, maintaining your fiduciary interest, are really increasing. Um, on the retail investor side, there are some you know, longstanding um, uh, organizations like uh, Calvert, um, and there are you know, equivalents in Europe that are available. Um, what we have seen uh, when we launched the RISE Fund, and you know, now increasingly in the alternative investment market, is that there are newer product offerings. A lot of what happened in Impact used to live in the venture space, but uh, the RISE Fund was solidly uh, articulated to be a growth investor in, in private equity. Um, most of our investors come from the traditional pension fund um, or uh, sovereign wealth fund uh, world. So there are opportunities even beyond uh, TPG. We are now an ecosystem with other private equity firms having launched funds. Um, and there's everything in, in between in the real asset side on the bond side. And it just takes sometimes a conversation with your, your money manager or your wealth manager. Um, if they don't know about impact, if they don't know about ESG, it's time for you to find a new money manager because this is uh, where the future is heading and it's it's incredibly important and those those opportunities and products are out there. Yeah, and we have just about a minute left here, Kelly. Parting words of advice. Number one, simple way for people to get involved. You know, I would say um, start by asking what do your employees care about? What do your customers care about? And then focus your ESG efforts there. You know, the data has proven that companies can do well by doing good. Benevity is uh, a great example of this. There are many others. And so if you're not um, yet leaning into these areas, there, there's a real benefit there to your people and your ability to build talent. So um, just find out what people care about and find your purpose and start leaning in.